the program book as well as uh, in the different links. You can actually click on the, the link in the program book. Here's another set of silver sponsors, um, especially if you are in the, in the area with Wegmans, they are an excellent store, check them out. Chelsea Green Publishing, just to give a shout out. Uh, NOFA Mass is working to make our racial equity statement a living and breathing document. And in that, it, it constantly guides our work and informs our work. And you may have seen some of that throughout the conference. In the interest of reconciling the harm that white supremacy and all forms of discrimination has and continues to cause in the food and agricultural system, we're asking all of our conference participants, our members, to act as allies and accomplices to BIPOC-led organizations and communities. And so with that, we offer a few suggestions on how to do that. First, um, you could provide resources to on the ground BIPOC led communities that are working to provide food, particularly in this pandemic. Um, some examples of organizations that you could possibly assist in your area are groups like Gardening and Community in Springfield, Sprout Change in Worcester, the Urban Farming Institute and the Boston Mattapan area. So any resources you can provide is helpful. We, uh, you can work on your own personal bias. We all have it, I have it. And one way of doing that is joining Food Solutions New England's uh, 21 day racial equity challenge. We'll put that link in the chat for you. And then lastly, uh, you can support uh, legislative agendas like the Massachusetts Indigenous Legislative Agenda. Um, very easily to, to do that by going to their link and we'll place that link in the chat towards the end as well. So, um, okay. Well, welcome everyone. I'm happy to be here this uh, beautiful Sunday morning. It's a little bit chilly outside, uh, but it's sunny and that's a good sign and it's gonna be uh, very nice uh, the rest of the week. So um, welcome to this workshop. Um, again, my name is Apollo Catala. I manage the Oasis on Baloo Farm, which is located in Dorchester, uh, about 20,000 square feet of space, we currently grow on about half of that. And every year we have um, expanded a little bit, but we always have practiced uh, one form or another of integrated pest management, which is um, a, an attempt to um, be a, a organic. It's not totally uh, so in the, in the bigger agricultural world, but it can be done organically and that's, um, and that's our focus. And in fact, um, we will be focusing primarily on, on the organic um, components of it. Um, let's go to the next slide. Again, welcome to um, our collaborative workshop. I say collaborative because one of the things that I want, that I would like is for us to um, develop a community of, um, integrated pest management practitioners, um, uh, you know, it, virtually and, uh, and share resources, share best practices, uh, share uh, experiences that we have had, you know, good or bad. And uh, in that way, we uh, expand our capacity to um, use this very useful tool in our growing uh, endeavors. Uh, next slide. So a brief tour and introduction to the Oasis on Baloo uh, Avenue Urban Farm. You could see our newly uh, erected uh, high tunnel to the, um, well, it's on the right um, picture, the, the right photo image, and you see some of our growing space. Um, next slide. So this is inside the, um, the Baloo, a uh, high tunnel uh, where greens are thriving and my, uh, they are thriving. We have done very well this fall and we still have a lot of stuff going on. And I note that occasionally <laughs> there are aphids. One of um, the uh, uh, insects uh, that, you know, affects all of our growing, um, I would imagine, but it certainly does at Baloo and is a bit of a challenge. Um, and with the high tunnel, we have this great new space, but we also have that challenge. So far, 
is an occasional one, but we have strategies for staying ahead of the APHIS, which can be very uh, prolific in, in, uh, in their um, habits. So um, let's go to the next slide. We're gonna, in this set of photos, we have on the left um, some race beds um, along with the orange flowers, which I'm sure you will all recognize as marigolds. And um, in this other photo, we have race beds and grow bags. Just to give you an idea of what we do at, uh, at Baloo, these um, uh, photos and the tour is, is relevant to uh, providing context to our um, workshop. Next slide, please. You can tell that I'm a big believer in row covers, um, so much so that we have them outside and inside the high tunnel. Um, the use of low tunnels in, with, in a high tunnel is very common, um, but they're here because they are a means for keeping pests in check. And, um, and we'll get into that a, a bit more. Next slide. Um, here's a set of questions that um, have uh, uh, some obvious answers and there are no wrong answers. We, um, the questions are intended to, um, to ground us in um, our, our, our workshop. Um, try to answer these uh, today while I, uh, and while you're, and you could put them in the chat, you could put them in a, in a post um, workshop email, um, you know, again, the idea is to build a community of uh, practitioners um, and collaborators. Um, these questions are, like I said, um, uh, intended to ground us, and I'm going to give some answers in a second, but before we go there, I want to um, just try to set a couple of ground rules or suggestions. You could ask questions. Um, we, I will do my best to answer your questions. Um, and uh, you could use the chat to, a, to ask questions. Um, and if the question uh, is better suited for another part of the discussion, I will hold it off on it, but uh, rest assured we will make our, be our best efforts to um, answer your questions. So here we go, six questions. Um, does how we grow food matters? Um, why grow food in the first place? Very obvious one answer. Um, why do it? Why do I do it? Why do you do it? Um, and what is IPM and why does it matter? Um, should it? Uh, all of this, um, is, is, and the last lately, um, probably the most important, how can we, how can understanding IPM and using IPM help us grow, uh, ooh, a typo, the food that sustains us all. Okay, so um, let's go to the next, uh, well, before we go to the next slide, you know, I use the phrase food matters because how gro growth, whether growth, to ask the question, food matters, what, growing food matters is to emphasize a concept that thanks to the Black Life Movement has um, uh, has become um, very important and has uh, taken a front and center position. And, it, it, and when we ask the question, does it matter? We really are at, we're, we're, we're taking a deep dive in that question. And obviously um, people who come to no, uh, NOFA conferences, uh, you know, food matters, how we grow it matters for us. So. Um, just, um, I just wanted to pause that because it's, it's something that deserves a, a, some, some contemplation. Food matters, how we grow it matters. So next slide, please. So again, you should answer this for yourself, but yes, of course, uh, how we grow food matters. Um, we know that if we don't grow it in the right way, uh, we, uh, in a sustainable way, uh, in an organic way, we will uh, 
harm the environment and consequently harm our families and communities. You know, and, and after all, the reason why we grow to begin with is because it is life sustaining. Um, but sometimes you wouldn't matter. I mean, you, you wouldn't think it because of how we, how, how modern agricultural practices have and continue to contribute to um, damage to the environment. And, you know, it is a contradiction to engage in an activity that's supposed to sustain us and is essential for human existence at the same time that we are uh, damaging the environment and damaging ourselves directly with the food that we, you, we, we grow um, and uh, the environment in which we all have to uh, li live. So I, I do this in, in, in um, large part because I am committed to promoting individual uh, community and environmental wellness among people of color and beyond. And we, I am committed to doing this by expanding access to sustainably grown food across the urban, um, peri-urban, rural, regional, and beyond um, food system continuum because it is always, it is a multidimensional, um, uh, it's multidimensional in nature. So um, again, you know, share your thoughts as to what motivates you. Um, again, and if we, um, you know, going to the last question, how can, how can understanding and using IPM help us grow food that sustains life in all its dimensions? Question, well, let's find out. Let's have a discussion around that. Next slide, please. By way of emphasis, I always add to this, uh, this uh, notion that I grow for love of self, family, community, and environment. These are my future farmers. Uh, they're my grand uh, nieces, yeah, uh, and nephews. And um, they made my day at the beginning of the year when they were bugging me about growing kale because they wanted to grow kale. And I thought that was all, oh, that's great. So anyway, we, get it, we gotta get them started young. Um, it's you know, part of that integrated pest management. So here we go, integrated growing. Um, next slide, please. So what is uh, integrated pest management? Um, here's a definition, pretty standard. But uh, and some principles to remember about um, integrated pest management. Uh, it is a broad based approach that integrates practice uh, for economic control of pests. IPM aims to suppress pest populations below the economic injury level. Now, that definition or oh, that concept is really more reflective of. Um, commercial agriculture, but it has a place in uh, urban farming, definitely, because we do grow for the public, but it also has a place in our gardens because no one likes to um, have their uh, crops, their garden um, plants compromised. So it may be that for gardeners, you know, you could put a harvested, kale with aphids on it under the faucet and you know and it'll be all right but that is not always the case with every um uh that's not always the case with all um pests and certainly it's not the case if you are sharing your harvest or you're um putting it in the market or some, somehow making it available for other people so um the end use definition of uh, ipm is is a really well considered. And um, I think that it really hits this, uh, the points that we're con most concerned about. And uh, I'll read a little bit of it, the careful consideration of all available pest control techniques and subsequent <clears throat> integration of appropriate measures that discourage the development of pest populations that keep pesticides and keep pesticides and other interventions to levels that are economically justify <clears throat> and reduce or minimize risk to human health and the environment. Excuse me. 
that is <clears throat> the notion of uh, reducing min uh, or minimizing risk to human health and the environment <clears throat> are paramount. So the emphasis is on growth of healthy crops with least possible disruption to the agro ecosystem and in, um, and encourage an encouragement of natural pest control mechanisms. Okay, next slide, please. The first principle of integrated pest management is that we do not try to eradicate or control, to, uh, but rather control uh, pest populations. So the reality is that wiping out an entire pest population uh, is not only impossible, probably, uh, but it can be expensive. And even beyond that, um, it can be unsafe and lead to probably unintended consequences. Um, so the approach that IPM takes first uh, as a first step is to establish a level of acceptance um, call action uh, thresholds and apply controls um, once those thresholds are, are crossed. Um, these thresholds are specific, uh, meaning that it is ac what may be acceptable in one site um, is not necessarily acceptable in another. Likewise, what may be acceptable with respect to one type of crop may not be acceptable with um, another. But in that last bullet, uh, this is very important that by reducing the use of synthetic pesticides, which is very common today um, and sometimes tempting for even urban uh, and home gardeners, um, we increase the risk that pests will develop resistance to those um, synthetics. And, you know, and so we don't want that. Um, but let me also add that this idea of not, eradic not eradicating but controlling is very important. Imagine what would happen if, um, and, and, and I should say that in the world of IPM, insects are generally uh, cater categorized as beneficial um, or destructive or harmful. It, 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 so it, it, if you were to, um, if we were to successfully eradicate harmful insects, um, what will become of the beneficial insects? Those are the insects that um, depend on other insects, typically um, those harmful insects for sustenance. They eat those, they, they eat those uh, harmful insects. Um, and if, if, if what would become of, of beneficial insects if they didn't have a food source? Well, you know, they might evolve, they might take a long time, but they might evolve and they might become vegetarians. So we, we that would be an unintended consequences. Most likely these um, beneficial insects would just go somewhere else um, uh, to another uh, farm, to another garden. And, um, and that would mean that we will be left largely unprotected for the next wave, inevitable wave of insects that will come in. Um, and also, if those um, beneficial insects depart our garden, then um, we lose pollinator, pollinating health, which is another benefit of um, uh, these um, of beneficial insects. So, at the bottom line, that I, I that I like to think about when I'm thinking of eradicating, controlling, is that Mother Nature abhors a, a an imbalance. And when you eradicate or you, are, or you do too much of a one thing, you are creating an imbalance and that's not a good recipe. So um, let's keep that in mind. Let's keep things balanced and um, remember that ground, that, that fundamental um, that part of the definition that talks about uh, reducing risk to, in, to health, health risk to in the humans 
and to the environment. Next slide, please. So this is a, this slide has two collections of uh, beneficial insects on top and then destructive insects um, in the bottom. And one of the things that you ought to be doing as you go forward, uh, and you probably do, um, and is make sure that you um, understand uh, and know what to look for in, in your insects, which ones are the good insects, which ones are the uh, destructive insects. And, um, and keep in mind, and we'll get into this a little bit, that um, some of these insects, they all go through a life stage. So you might not recognize um, some of them as beneficial if you encounter them, unless you have taken time to uh, study or at least become familiar with their different stages of life. The uh, ladybug, for example, uh, has a stage where it looks more like a, a worm than it does um, a ladybug, but that's, and that's just one example. Um, the same goes for um, one of my um, favorite nemesis, only because I think I've I have found a way to control it is the, the tomato hornworm. Um, you know, it, it, it goes through different phases and you wouldn't know that you have a problem um, if you don't recognize the different phases. We'll get, we'll get into that as we go along. Let's go to the next um, slide, please. Uh, speaking of the tomato hornworm, which is a voracious, uh, eater destructive of nightshade um, plants, including tomatoes, peppers, uh, eggplants, um, but especially tomato, hence the tomato on worm. And if you uh, check out the first slide uh, of the collection, it is a, um, at, at, the, at the pupae stage. And, and then the next one is what, it comes out of, it's sort of as if it came out of um, central casting as a monster. And, um, and then from there, it goes into that butterfly uh, or moth. Um, and, and that just gives you a, 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 a sense of what it takes to um, know your, your pets. And the last, um, photo is uh, a tomato horn uh, worm afflicted with larvae. These larvae are put in there um, by a beneficial insect, which is a wasp that lays its eggs inside a healthy uh, tomato horn worm. And those larvae, um, you know, eat, munch on the hornworm from the inside out. So it's out of central casting and in keeping with um, uh, horror movies is just like aliens. Uh, it's kind of neat. Um, and we're going to get into a sec. Oh, I actually, I alluded to it in the beginning. For some reason, the wasp, Brachnoids wasp, that is a... Uh, uh, that, that does this is attracted to uh, marigolds. And that's why I put marigolds at the beginning. That's why I have been in the year I have been farming. I do not farm without having a marigold plant nearby. I actually have a lot of them. Uh, sometimes we have the whole uh, perimeter of the farm planted in marigolds or at least the front um, fence, which is uh, over a hundred feet. So that is one recommend, specific recommendation that I would um, uh, make to everyone who wants to uh, control uh, pests in, in your garden. And it, that one um, has other benefits. You know, it's not just for the nice shade family, but it is a, 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 a tremendous ally and it brings together 
um, uh, the plan and, and the, uh, the WASP that uh, takes care of business. So next slide, please. Okay, so the second um, IPM principle uh, focuses on being preventive and proactive. So we wanna prevent um, uh, problems. Um, so this is um, selecting varieties for local growing conditions and maintaining healthy crops in the, you know, is, is the first line of defense. So when you are planning your garden for next year, like right now, we're looking through those uh, beautiful catalogs, including some from our sponsors like Johnny's uh, Fedco and High Mowing, you know, take time to read the specs for the seeds that you want to order because there's a lot of useful information. And um, sometimes it's a little bit, um, you know, you get distracted by the beautiful pictures and you're not paying attention to the fine print. The fine print matters um, and uh, for selection of the crops. Obviously, um, another thing that matters here is maintaining the quality of your soil and the growing condition. And um, that's a, 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 a subject for another um, workshop, but important. And I love the work that uh, NOFA, that we do uh, uh, concerning soil health and it, it is relevant and it speaks to and reflects that multi-dimensional um, uh, aspect of, of, of growing food in a, in, a in a responsible and sustainable way. So um, going, continuing to, with the um, other um, uh, conduct that is uh, called for in the second principle is um, if you do run into um, problems and you have afflicted plants, um, you may want to consider move, uh, taking them out, quarantining them or taking them out. Um, you also want to be mindful of sanitizing your equipment um, and um, such as your, you know, pruners particularly, but not just that. And, you know, notice here, removal of pet, uh, deceased plants. I have a, a reservation about doing that. Um, and sometimes you can plant, uh, a strategy is to plant a, a tra trap crop. So I have a bed where I do a variety of kale and one variety is the favorite for aphids. But I've noticed that they, don't like some of the other ones and that they don't really, you know, they, and they don't really attack some of the other uh, um, uh, um, uh, kale in that bed. So some, sometimes I just let them be. Um, I don't totally do that, but I don't pull them out. I may um, uh, use an organic solution to deal with them. Um, to try to control them. But it is interesting that other kale can act as a trop crop as well as other crops, including um, uh, bok choy, for example, which is known uh, to um, make a very good um, trop crop when it comes to aphids, for example. So um, the other point, on this slide is beneficial fungi and bacteria are, are added to the potty mix. That's, that's, that makes sense. Um, you might want to do that, but you also might have, but you know, this, this is a nursery uh, practice, but you could also introduce that in, in, in your own soil. And we'll touch slightly on that, um, on adding beneficial uh, fungi. Um, at, uh, towards the end of um, um, towards the end of the workshop. Okay, next slide, please. So this is probably the most important thing that you can do in is is, is monitor. 
And what I suggest um, is depending on the size of your garden or your growing space, urban farm or whatever you have, you want to have a regular schedule um, to just observe, take a look at what's going on with the plants, look under the leaves, over the leaf, um, at the uh, look at 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 the main um, stem as it comes out um, out of the soil, um, and you also want to keep records of what you're doing, what your observations are, the time of the year that it happens, um, and as we alluded to in the beginning, you know we have all these bad insects. Um, or harmful insects, they're not bad, bad. They're just, you know, they have a different role. They eat, they eventually die and they add organic matter to the soil. So there's no real bad thing. So that's just on quotes. Um, but one of the things that you might need to do because some of these pests are really hard to, to uh, spot. You gotta get used to, um, knowing what you're looking for. You also may need a magnifying glass. You may um, need a brush that while you're doing this and you need an appointed time. Um, and that helps you kind of do it uh, on a regular basis so that you don't, so that it becomes a routine. At, the, at Baloo, we uh, do a portion of the farm, 20% um, of the farm every, every weekday. Uh, so, you know, every, every week we do another 20% so that by the time um, we are, by the time the week ends, we have um, scouted um, all of our crops. Um, sometimes, um, you know, we do it with more frequency if we know that there is a problem. Okay, next slide, please. So one of those, uh, you know, I mentioned magnifying glass uh, is critical. Um, and this is an example. Uh, we will uh, provide um, more um, a, uh, resources on scouting. Um, and uh, it might, you know, with, with the recording and, uh, and post uh, workshop. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. And the fourth principle of IPM, mechanical controls, uh, in the commercial field, it should is is preface, should pests reach a unacceptable uh, level, mechanical controls should be uh, the first option. Um, I, you could tell from what I've what you've seen that they're a, for some crops they are the <laughs> they're, they're the the zero level option not one you know but zero level uh, option um so but you know other examples uh and and you know the, that's that's the case with the row covers but other things that you can do and this you you do when it is uh when it's indicated but um hand pick and it, it, you know, I wouldn't recommend this for aphids or for uh, flea beetles, but um, for um, snails, uh, slugs, um, it works. Um, I just wouldn't pick them, I mean, without my gloves on, that's for sure. Um, but the, the, for me, the, the, the barrier row covers remains the, the uh, uh, the same though I have done tra trap crops uh, and actually um, sticky traps, um, which I don't like as much because sometimes they do um, uh, they capture uh, beneficial insects. Vacuuming uh, is something that we have played around with a little bit. Um, and it is something to consider. Maybe someone has had, um, better uh, or good experience with that. Um, I really dying to try it with harvested uh, brassicas that are uh, moderately to heavily inf infected just to see how that vacuum works out. Um, that's a work in progress. 
And uh, the other one is to um, till the ground uh, to uh, moder really, this is low intense uh, tilling of the ground. I have reservations about that, uh, but it is something to consider because um, we want to be no till um, is the name of the, you know, that, that, that's called for now. But I, again, my favorite approach is for, especially for brassicas, is to use row cover. And in addition, um, I will probably be uh, using insect netting, which is um, another option uh, to consider because it does not change the temperature um, within uh, under the the, the row cover. I um, mean, you know, on in the bed, in row cover, it does change um, uh, the temperature and. Keep in mind, in that sense, that you're using row covers for as a season extension. You, know, you get double benefits. You get season extension if appropriate. You don't, you know, you don't want to be using row cover in the summer, but you can use it in the spring part of the growing season as well as in the um, fall going into winter. And um, and and they are. Um, their, their row covers are perfect for brassicas. They're not a fruiting um, crop. So if you have um, drip, a drip line, you're, it's terrific. And if, you know, cause then you, you don't have to even uncover them to water them. And if you, you know, and, 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 and the uh, row cover allows the sun to go through. So um, it, it, it's very useful. Uh, insect netting has the promise of, um, again, um, not affecting temperatures. So that is something that you can use in the summer. And we will be um, using that uh, at, at, at Baloo um, <clears throat> in the greenhouse as well as in um, the high tunnel. I mean, in the high tunnel as well as outside the high tunnel. Okay, next slide, please. So. Here are some of my favorite mechanical controls, which you already seen. Um, uh, next slide. So moving on to uh, the fifth um, principle, um, you know, the emphasis is to use natural biological processes and materials. So um, two come to mind immediately, which I use very carefully. Um, and one is diatomaceous earth. Um, if I can control the application of that, I, I, uh, I mean, I, I have my eyes and I don't um, put it on the plants as much as I put it on the base on the, on the soil around the plants. Um, that, so the other one that I occasionally use and have um, used more often is neem oil, um, organically certified, obviously, um, concentrated, you dilute that in water and you don't need a whole lot and you spray it on that, you can spray on, on the plants and you do have to keep up with it um, but your best, your chances of success are best when um, you um, do it on a consistent basis and you do it early. So that's why scouting is so important. If you have uh, a low uh, presence of aphids, that's the time to um, try to take care of the deal of them with um, neem uh, oil. Um, okay, next slide. So these critters, I'm sure their, their mamas love them, are um, not, they're, well, I don't like them. They don't, they look yucky. <laughs> um, and we get a lot of these at Baloo and we usually, um, 
take care of them by shoveling them up and sending them on their way to becoming something else, as fertilizer, um, or, <clears throat> um, yeah, that's what we do. Now, there is um, another uh, recommended uh, or suggested approach, uh, and that is to um, bury a opened can of tuna fish at ground level so, uh, and fill it with uh, beer. Um, I would suggest using the least expensive one, but supposedly uh, this, uh, the yeast in the beer will um, uh, attract the um, snails and slug and they go in there and, and, and they, um, they drown. So, um, this is um, another another one of those that we uh, we have thought about um, using, but we have not gotten to that point yet. Um, but I'm, I I would be interested if anybody has done it. Um, I think that it makes sense, and the um, and I got this from a fairly re, uh, reliable source. So. Um, we, and I have all the tuna, <laughs> tuna fish can all ready to go. Um, so it's just a question of getting the beer and and putting and deploying them. So we'll see. Okay, next slide, please. Here's um, uh, a blown up picture of aphids. They come in many many different colors, and you notice in the first photo on the left that these are on the underside of the leaf, um, you know, you gotta look for them. Next slide, please. Ah, we all get used to seeing that white moth. That white moth is not your typical butterfly. Uh, that's the that's the moth of the um, cabbage worm. Um, and very destructive, uh, you know, mechanically, um, you're not gonna control this um, uh, catching the, the butterfly. We have tried that. Um, and that is really probably uh, the best, well, a, a strategic time to, to interrupt their life cycle, but, um, this one, uh, you got to really get down to it and um, remove them and, um, and look at the soil where the, where the uh, worm is going to be located. So, um, and of course, you have your diatomaceous earth directly would be uh, work well. Um, and, you know, what, which would, again, if you attack them directly, uh, you will not... Um, um, you, you reduce the risk to beneficial insects. Um, moving right on. Next slide, please. Uh, flea beetle, I mentioned, this is very, um, oops, back, yep, great. This is a, um, it's a very, you know, flea beetles, as you probably all know, it are very small. They don't have big mouths. So at some point, your plant may outgrow um, their threat. So if you have um, if if you have a, uh, a a low infestation, they're not gonna be that problematic. Um, uh, but Again, this is a case where the row cover and insect netting would make a huge difference. So I would definitely recommend that. Um, next slide, please. Okay, these guys are very uh, dis destructive. Um, and especially um, the Japanese beetles and, and the, 
oh, the grasshopper, how did that get out of order? The grasshopper and, and the cucumber beetle um, and not shown, but also is the um, squash um, borer. Uh, and um, with respect to the squash, one of the latest uh, techniques that I've come across and that I have tried, and it seems to be somewhat beneficial, but it's, the jury is, is out on it because we um, only tried it late in the process. And, um, and that is to, uh, at the root, to wrap some aluminum foil um, I, 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 from the root to uh, a couple of inches um, up on, on, on the stem, on the main stem. Um, so that remains to be seen. I think that um, that is something that we grow a lot of um, squash and it's something that we will be trying out. We'll, we won't do all of the plants, but we'll try, we might do every other plant or just do a portion of them just out of caution and see how that happens, uh, how, how that works. Because um, our squash every year are, are do very well until then out of nowhere, they just die. And, but, you know, it's okay. It happens. And um, the, um, the in, in the case of the cucumber beetle, that one, you know, you got to just scout again, everything benefits from scouting. Um, and, and uh, also, um, with with the nice shades and you know in this case oh, or, a, or a cucumber plant, you you need to keep it open for pollination purposes. So um, that's a little bit harder, but um, you know you just gotta stay on top of it by scouting and removing infected plants. And um, they're also a larger uh, beetle, so they're easier to deal with. Um, mechanically in some ways. I mean, you do have to, um, if you have a large space, it could be quite a, a lot of work, but if you have a smaller home garden, that's not a bad, um, it's not, it's, it's not bad. It, it, it should work. Um, you can um, shake them onto a bucket of water and toss them out later. Make sure that you help them uh, on their way to becoming something else. Uh, so, um, and um, that is how you might um, deal with that. And the, 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 the Japanese beetle is very uh, destructive. Um, again, that one is larger and one that you can handle by hand. Um, and uh, they are, um, and they are, um, other ways, um, mostly mechanical, yeah, mostly mechanical on that one. And you can also try the diatomaceous earth um, and, and um, other organic um, uh, remedies. Okay, let's see, next slide, I think we're getting close to the end. Okay, now, right. Now, this is uh, the sixth IPM principle, which is spraying them with synthetic pesticides. I um, don't subscribe to this, and I don't think that you would need to do this in a small garden, home garden. Um, you know, and I would encourage you to uh, exhaust all the other uh, methods for controlling um, your uh, pests, um, you know, and, and avoid this, this, this synthetic option, um, um, you know, and just avoid it if you can, uh, unless, and, and if you can, then, you know, then you cross that bridge when you get there. Um, but you're not out of options. Um, there are newer pesticides that are derived from plants or naturally occurring substance. Um, and some of them are, uh, um, you know, uh, are, are diatomaceous earth, for example, um, and some of them are more sophisticated, um, and they they can be of help. 
Um, again, in the resources, we'll provide a, um, a, a, a so post uh, workshop, we'll provide a link to um, some of those. Um, but again, uh, you have to be careful with any application, even neem, neem oil, make sure that you're are focusing and the automations, as I've, I've said, making sure that you're focusing on the intended targets and not um, do a general um, uh, treatment without, with, without regard to uh, beneficial insects. So, um, you know, matching the whatever you use, uh, even the organic ones, the organic options to the pests and the circumstances uh, prevailing is um, super important. So you want to um, be mindful of that. And I think that was this, the last slide is just resources. Uh, let's go to that. Yeah, go back to um, um, the previous slide. Yeah. And um, why don't we open it up for some questions? And um, if. Sure. All right. Excellent. Excellent. This has been such a, a informative and a wonderful presentation. So uh, Ashley has been gathering some questions, I believe. So yeah, Ashley. Could you hold on, uh, Anna, could, uh, Anna, could you hold on a second? I just want to raise my volume because it's very low. If I could just. Sure. In a second. Or you might, or I might have to ask you to. Uh, oops, I can't seem to. Okay, I can't seem to go. Okay, I got it now. Let, give me a second. I'll be right with you. I just wanna. Actually, we have no questions written in the chat just yet. But now okay. that the presentation has concluded, if anybody has thought of something or would like to engage Apollo in um, a discussion, like I saw somebody added something about squash borer that was helpful. Um, but I think um, if anybody has a question, please just type um, in the chat box and then uh, feel free once I acknowledge you to unmute yourself. Um, personally, Apollo, I thought that was such a well-rounded and really wonderful explanation of IPM. I truly, I've seen this topic, but you really, honestly, like I, as somebody who practices this on my farm, I really felt like you started from the beginning explaining exactly what it means. I saw so many heads nodding and people like eyes lighting up. So first of all, thank you very much. You're most welcome, uh, Ashley. And by the way, can you um, read the comment on uh, if 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 there if we don't have any questions, we might want to just read the co the comment on uh, squash bore. Great. Well, now questions are pouring in, so okay, I'll read all of them over <laughs> you. The first one was from Christy. She said, for squash borer, I have found that the egg laying usually occurs before flowering and pollination. So using a row cover well secured over the hills of young plants from seeding and transplanting until flowering can intervene with these pests. Row cover can be removed when flowers appear and pollinators must be admitted. You know, I, I that is so true. I discovered this um, dealing with another pest that we have not addressed. Um, I, I, my, the Oasis of Baloo is, is, is a groundhog habitat. Hmm. And, and I, I, you know, to discourage them, I, you know, I'm not giving them enough credit for their intelligence. I, I, I deploy <laughs> row cover over the, over the squash and the one that were young and, um, early in the season. And, um, and it, it really worked, you know, it really, and I knew that they were in there because they were munching on the, uh, uh, on stuff and, but it, it worked and I, and I kept wondering about that. And I did put that together and thank you, um, whoever put that on there, because that, that is a good suggestion. And I think that that comment illustrates how important it is to know your insects, you know, when are they, at, at their different stages. And, you know, and in the, in the case of the squash bug, it is on the soil. So, you know, that's the time to, uh, and, and, and also know your plant. So your plant is growing, a squash is growing and it, it is, is not 
it hasn't reached the, 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 the pollinating stage. So give some protection at that point and also be aggressive around scouting in that soil um, as much as possible. Okay. Fantastic, Apollo. I, great. All right, first question from Jessica Taylor. What does Apollo think of the grasshopper pesticide NOLO? I was overrun by grasshoppers this past summer. Is it, uh, it, it, is it a organic? Jessica, uh, you can unmute yourself. Oops, oh yeah. I believe it is organic, yes. Well, you know, it is, it's a tough call. How, how big of a space are you growing in? Um, less than a quarter acre. Okay, so that's pretty, that, that's, that's, that's sounds big. You're not, you're not, you don't have a raised bed, a, a, a four by, by 10 raised bed. Right. <laughs> so, so um, I would, and depending on what you're growing, um, I, I, I would, uh, you know, if you, if you have brassicas, obviously your, your solution is, is going to be um, uh, row cover, but I'm sure that you have more than than, than brassicas uh, in in your space. So, um, I if it, and if it's organic, I would give it a shot, um, but monitor it very carefully, um, and, and and you know, and see how it how it turns out. Um, gr grasshoppers. Uh, are, uh, you know, they should be obvious, but sometimes I miss them. I don't know where they were a couple of years because I've, this year, this past year, I saw more than, than I've ever seen before. In fact, I thought that they weren't, they weren't there, but they were. Um, um, so I might be, uh, I, I may be, uh, you know, uh, reaching out to you to see how that works because maybe there is, uh, if if the harm is significant, I, and it sounds like in your case, um, it, it was, then you might want to consider it. But then proceed with caution and moderately. If it's an or, if it's an organic, um, and then if it's not, then that's a different issue. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Next question: How did you originally come to the use of IPM? Ah, <laughs> I was um, in a, a that is, a, I, I remember the day and I remember the person. Um, I was in, I was training at the Urban Farming Institute at that time uh, to really, you know, increase my, my knowledge as I transition into uh, farming. Um, and um, I, I was visiting the food project and they had uh, a woman um, uh, who from UMass Extension who came um, and gave a talk on IPM and uh, and she gave she uh, you know I had a link to a publication from uh, the Pennsylvania Extension which is kind of like a leading and that's how I got interested in it. Um, also, it was part of our training that we would plant uh, marigolds. We, <laughs> that's where I got marigolds from. And we celebrated the demise of tomato hornworms. Um, and, and I was convinced, uh, even though I, I am not a scientist, but I'm scientific, you know, uh, scientific enough to uh, always question, the cost and effect is this is is this just something that happened by chance or is it something that happened by really because uh, marigolds and the bacchanal wasps are making are doing their thing and I, what I've and I haven't you know done a trial comparing one without growing with marigolds and growing without marigolds but I am convinced that it works it is very beneficial in the case of tomato hornworms now um it, it you know it 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 um it could be that you know we just never had that many but uh, it, it's i i choose to believe that it works and uh plus they're pretty and the pollinators like them so we go with them wonderful 
Next question is from Mary. Uh, Mary wants to know if you have a good reference to help identify bugs in their different life stages. Um, yes, um, there are some good ones out there and I do have, um, and, and, but just, just being aware of that idea, you could just Google a particular bug and, um, and um, I, there, is, there is one um, website out of, I believe, Iowa you know, uh, Extension School that uh, emphasizes the life, uh, uh, the, the life cycle of, 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 of both beneficial and um, uh, harmful uh, um, insects. And we're going to provide that in the in the chat. I I um and I, but I think that that's an important question, and I think you could find a lot of resources on the internet. And but I and I think you got to develop your own um you know bank of information that that you can because I find um sometimes I find I am challenged to um you know d do exactly that identify and 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 keep in mind when. What, what stage they're in so that, because the stage that they're in um, uh, imp uh, has implications for the method of control. And so, so bottom line, um, be on the lookout for that. That resource is, oh, I forget, I, it, it, it's, it's got an acronym, it's very interesting and it, and it is, the, the emphasis is using alternative controls. So they go heavy on um, planting, um, on, on, on herbs, flowers to attract beneficial insects. Um, they also emphasize uh, nematodes and um, fungi, organic fun, fungi and, 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 and things of that nature. Thank you. And Anna is posting links at the bottom of the chat, folks, like the Iowa State University Extension, things like that, um, as Apollo's mentioning them, which is lovely. Next yeah. And yeah. we, if if I can just add, Ashley, and maybe Anna could do this at some point, uh, if not today, later. But um, we were on a NOFA um, uh, workshop uh, last week or a couple of weeks on using nematodes um, as to control pests, and um, it is uh, is it was fascinating. So we that's that's another resource, and these fungi uh, occur um naturally but we you can enhance your soil um by adding to them but you know you need to uh, educate yourself and a good place to start is that um uh the the, the workshop on that was that nofa recently had okay all right. Now, this is a great question from, <clears throat> this is from Carol, and I actually have this issue as well. Um, what about grubs? Currently considering buying nematodes for the use in the spring. I heard it's okay to have a few grubs per square feet for birds, but we have some areas that had over 15. Oh my God. You know, there are, there are hideous to look at in my... <laughs> Um, but, but I, I, um, I, I think that that is, that is the way to go. I, uh, I, I come across them, not many, um, you know, and we immediately help them along to becoming something else. Um, but I, 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 I was actually, when I, when I did the workshop on, uh, on nematodes, I thought, hmm. That's something to try. I don't think we have a big problem. Um, I don't see it manifesting itself in the in the health of the plants, but you know, you never know. And, and that would be that would be my inclination uh, um, for that particular pest. Great. Next, we have a question from Ken. Do you try to attract? Oh, I'm sorry, I missed one. Yes, it's from Ken. Actually, it's it's a two point question. What other natural traps do you use, and do you try to attract other predators? Um, natural traps, I have not felt the need to use, um, but 
my mind is open because this year uh, we have more pest issues, particularly aphids um, and grasshoppers. And, um, you know, we grow on a really about 10,000 square feet, uh, which is half of the, the half of the site is on a hill. So that gets a little tough. Um, so that's a, we're working on that. Uh, but in the meantime, that's what we're doing. And we, you know, um, we don't, we have very few options for ro rotating crops. And I don't know if that's the issue. I, I think that that is part of the issue that we're basically growing the same thing, uh, more or less in the same space, not far apart. So the, the, uh, the, the pressure is, is intensifying. So, um, you know, they are uh, those yellow stickies and they're different colors designed for different insects. Um, and they're used to monitor what the, uh, the, the presence of, uh, of, of, of the pests are. Um, sometimes good uh, pests uh, get stuck in it, um, but definitely attracting uh, beneficial insects is the way to go. Um, flowers, um, 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 sometimes also uh, and, and mint uh, herbs are, are also uh, helpful and sometimes they will even um, keep away bad bugs. So definitely you want to um, plant use flowers and anything that, it, it, that, that is listed as um, attracting beneficial um, insects you want to use. And you have the option of um, putting them in pots and moving them around. Uh, I'm not sure that that's the best option. That's what we do sometimes. And um, it seems to be going OK. Or you could just put them as part of a companion planting uh, plant in along your your um, your uh, you know your crops. Now um, the key ones to uh, attract are prey mantis. Although prey mantis are on the top of the food chain, and they will be they're known to eat some of the good guys as well. So you know we got to uh, don't overdo it. But if you are able to naturally attract a, a, um, a prey mantis, that's, you know, uh, kudos to you. Um, you, uh, you know, and, and the same thing with, with anything that you attract. I've already mentioned uh, wops that are, that like marigolds. Uh, um, ladybugs are not that discriminatory. They just like to be in the garden so far as I see. But if you get desperate, there is another uh, company that specializes in in um, beneficial insects, and you buy a bunch, and you know you learn when to release them, and you release them, and hope, and and make sure that you're providing uh, an environment that's going to help help them want to stay. So it, um, the flowers. Uh, the, the whatever other plants they like, that's what you want to do. Um, that company will put that in the um, in, in the chat. Is Abaco? Um, they they uh, they they have a, a uh, series of um, organic um, pesticide as well as I, I think if I recall correctly. But more importantly you could buy um, insects, beneficial insects from them and, um, and, and uh, other uh, supplies, including uh, traps that are supposedly uh, target um, certain insects without, while minimizing um, attraction uh, of beneficial insects. And, um, but you know, even if you end up going down that route, um, of buying, uh, you know, nothing that should that should really be a, a, a stop gap measure because you should be able to uh, plant 
um, do some companion planting that helps your eco environment. And that's what be my, that would be my primary recommendation. And that's our primary approach to attracting beneficial insects. I haven't gotten my first prey mantis yet, but I'm hopeful. Wonderful. Yes, we, um, my, I have little kids and we, for two years in a row, we did, uh, we bought the praying mantis Uthekas and released, one day you came home and there were thousands of praying mantis <laughs> in this container and they're like, just release them outside. And it was so cool. But um, then we quickly realized, oh my goodness, now we have a thousand praying mantis and what that meant. So, all right. So before we, um, I mean, we still have more time, but before we go, I do want to say that Apollo um, is a graduate of the Urban Farming Institute Beginning Farmer Program. So as you can see, I mean, you're a fount of knowledge. And so, you know, if you have a plug for this, this program, you know. I, I absolutely. And, uh, you know, and I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't uh, put a plug in for the Urban Farming Institute without also putting in a, pl a plug in for NOFA which is an incredible organization. My introduction to NOFA came through UFI. And I, I don't think I've missed too many conferences, uh, winter conferences. I, summer is a different thing. I'm up to my, I, I'm just too busy, but I, I, I almost went this year, but you know, COVID even made it uh, less likely. But next year, or maybe ne this summer, uh, next we'll, we'll, I'll be able to go, but definitely, um, I, I definitely want to put in a plug for um, UFI. It's a great training. Um, you know, they have the intro to uh, farming class, um, in in uh, which is you know with a little bit of field work, and then they have the intense summer program, which is you know you work five hours um, every day for uh, from June to October and. And you also travel around and you get exposed to a lot of fun activity. I am also involved with this new effort for beginning farmers um, with a complementary uh, approach, uh, a comp with a complementary uh, mission that's complementary to UFI and to uh, NOFA. And um, Anna is also part of that. And that's these um, Southern New England Farmers of Color Collaborative which has a beginning farmer grant and we're gonna be doing training around um, particular issues, including access to uh, farmland and, um, and um, really uh, looking at how urban farmers can collaborate with rural farmers. Cause I think that's the future of um, uh, that, that will help our food system be robust uh, as it should be. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions for Apollo? And Ashley, if I can jump in here on this note, I have to say my introduction to integrated pest management came from Apollo when he did a presentation for the trustees at their gardeners gathering. I utilize a lot of these processes in the community gardens that I work with here in Springfield in my own personal garden. So. He is indeed a, a wealth of knowledge. Um, and again, uh, thank you so much, Apollo, for such an informative presentation, a very easygoing presentation too. So um, Ashley, if there's no other questions, no other questions from uh, our community out there, we can go ahead and begin putting in some of our ending comments. Um, again, big thanks to Apollo. Uh, that particular workshop that the UMass Extension and NOFA Mass co-sponsored, um, that video should be up on our YouTube page very soon. So stay tuned. You can go back and check that out for NOFA Mass. Um, we have a couple of other things coming up uh, that I want to point out too for the conference. We would like you to visit our virtual marketplace. Uh, Ashley so kindly put in the link for us. And they are giving some discounts uh, for conference attendees. So please check it out. Also, we have a online auction that's going very well. Uh, please check that out as well. I think I'm in a bit of a bidding campaign for an item, which has been kind of fun. It is a fun thing to do, but it also helps to raise money for NOFA Mass that goes to pay for a lot of our work. And so we appreciate those who, um, who actually attend that. The link is there uh, at rallyup.com. 
Uh, so please check out our auction. Also, uh, in my opening, I was remiss, I did not mention this, but all of us are coming from different parts of the state that was once occupied by our indigenous family. Now, I am broadcasting from Pocumac land, which is actually Springfield, Mass. Uh, Apollo is coming from the area that was once the Massachusetts, bordered by the Wapanog, as well as the Nipmug. We know that uh, mm -hmm. as Boston. And that's Nipmuc. I said I didn't say that correctly, so please forgive me. Um, there is a way for you to go and see what lands you are living on that actually were preoccupied, that were occupied before colonization. And Ashley, I put that chat, um, I'll put that link in the chat for you to go and check out uh, actually who the land belonged to previously. So at this time, um, I don't think there's anything else. I want to thank again everyone for joining us. Uh, you were in the early morning session, so we appreciate your time. Apollo, big thanks once again. Apollo, what is your email address if people have questions for you? Yes, it's my Gmail address, the ApolloJCatala at gmail.com. So an Apollo is spelled with one L. So it's A-P-O-L-O-J-C-A-T-A-L-A at gmail.com. I put Great. that in the chat for everyone so that you can Ex see Thank you, Ashley. As well. Right. And uh, Apollo, does Oasis on Baloo have a website or, or a, a Facebook page so people can check out what y'all are doing? You know, uh, it, I, I, I should have mentioned that the Oasis on Baloo, is, the parent company is the, door the, the Common Square Neighborhood Development Corporation. Okay. So um, if you look at, uh, you could find it through there, there, there is a presence. Um, and we're in the process of uh, redoing our web page uh, our, and um, the same thing with, with um, Facebook. But, you know, if, if, even if you go there now, you don't find anything, um, you know, just, mm -hmm. um, um, you know, keep trying or hit me up. I, I, the easiest way to get a hold of me is by text um, and, uh, you know, I, you know, and then we could talk on the phone, but it, it I, I'll put down my number. Um, and um, let me see if I could, no, can you guys put it on the chat? Yes, uh, we can go is, ahead and put it in the chat it, for you. It is 617-642-5496. Okay. Yeah, and you know, the easiest, um, uh, for me, the easiest way to get a hold of me is send me a text, and then we figure out, you know, when it's a good time to talk uh, over the phone or Zoom. I'm getting used to them <laughs> uh, uh, more and more. And anybody, um, you know, you're welcome to visit um, uh, the Oasis. Uh, we could, you know, talk about collaborating, uh, whatever, mm -hmm. uh, change, exchanging ideas. Um, the Oasis on Baloo has been uh, the beneficiary of <laughs> farmers and um, uh, growers, gardeners across the state uh, because of COVID. Uh, we put out a call and people responded and it's just wonderful how, um, you know, if it takes a village to, uh, uh, grow a farm, uh, there is a village in Mass that grew more than one farm, and one of those farms is the Oasis on Baloo. So right. thank you. Come by anytime. All right. Well, thank you so much, Apollo, once again. Thank you to everyone who joined us. Ashley, thank you for your work with the questions and answers. It's great having you as a co-pilot today. You all have a wonderful day, and we will talk soon. Be well. Thank you both, and thank you all.